it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Robert McGrain, DMD, a 1979 graduate of the University of Florida College of Dentistry. He currently practices part-time in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and is a director of clinical advocacy for Heartland Dental, digital clinical technologies, scanners, and labs. He is a consultant to the University of Oklahoma College of Dentistry. He has spoken and published internationally on restorative, preventative dentistry, and technology. He has worked with a number of dental companies and biomaterials and technologies, including 3M, Densply Serona, Densply Cock, Premier Dental, um, Ivoclair Vivident, E4D, Plan Mecca, Patterson Dental, Shine. He is a member of the ADA and the AGD. And I wanted to bring you on the show. I asked you to come on. You didn't ask me because I, I don't know who would know more about oral scanning, dental labs, and dentistry than you. Because, number one, you're just a really smart guy who knows a lot about it. But you're in charge of uh, hundreds of lo- locations. How many, how many dentists are you working with that are using an oral scan in a lab that you're getting data points from? About, uh, about 1,700 right now. Wow. 1,700. And we have about 1,300 to 1,400 scanners in service and doing, um, we've done almost 2 million scans since we started our initiative. So say that uh, again, 1,700 dentists. Yeah. And with how many that's scanners? That's about 1,300 scanners. With 1,300 scanners um, who have done, uh, have taken uh, two mo- over 2 million scans. Yes, and well, we, I'm, we send I'm sorry. Out about... I gotta, I gotta cut this show uh, short because uh, I know another guy. He's done a uh, seventeen hundred and eighty dentists with thirteen hundred and ninety scans, and uh, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, nobody, nobody <laughs> is working with seventeen hundred dentists, thirteen with who own thirteen hundred scanners who have taken two million scans. And um, thanks for coming on the show and talking about it. Well, you're welcome. Because I, I do believe that, you know, we, um, a lot of dentists think, well, I don't have to really cut a great prep and take a great impression. I just get an oral scanner. I mean, the oral scanner will. Um, so my, my first question to you is, if I'm a CD dentist, does an oral scanner make me a B, A minus dentist? Or do you still have to be an A dentist and the scanner's just, I mean, have, th- does it make you better? Well, it makes you better if you make your preps better and you look at them. If, if you look at the scan, you're going to go, yeah, that's not so great. And so the difference between that and an impression is that you look at that little, imp- little impression and you go, yeah, they'll make it work. With a scanner, though, you look at it and it's 30 to 60 times bigger on the screen. You go, well, I thought that was a good prep. So, yeah, it's going to make you a better dentist. It really will. So is it a return on investment? You know, we, of course, when you're going to invest, you know, tens of millions of dollars, uh, we did a lot of data crunching. And that's, I think, you know, Howard, one of the things that I'm passionate about is that I've worked with KOLs. I was a small KOL. I mean, you know, not big time circuit, but we'll have our opinions and we make things work. And as a younger dentist in particular, or when I was in private practice, I worried like, well, I see them doing those amazing things on the screen, but I don't know if I can. And you know what? You can, because everything I talk about, we've done it, as you know, and I have the data for every single thing that we might say, I have the data. So the answer is yes, the return on investment is phenomenal and under one condition, and that is you take it out of the corner and you put it in the operatory. (laughs) <laughs> so, yes, that's the key. But if you do that, it's a huge win. I mean, you're, t- you're talking about uh, some of our doctors who jumped on board, you know, when we did first did this, they generated enough revenue the first week to pay for the scanner. Now, not everybody did that, but I don't think you can afford not to have a scanner. They're not expensive to own. They're expensive not to own. And that's just data. That's not my enthusiasm because I love scanners. It's the data that we have. Well, you know, I think all dentists can agree that the 
fastest way to increase your quality is just to be able to see better. It starts with loops. Uh, I got when I um, when you got out of school, it was two and a half, and then it goes up to mine are now three point eight. Um, Endodontist, um, that scope hanging on the ceiling from uh, um, you know the uh, the one in St. Louis or uh, uh, Germany. I mean Zeiss. Um, they're only four to eight X, but the endodontist, I know they don't work through it, but before they go to obturate, they pull over the scope and, and those like, Oh my God, there's a missed canal or, Oh, look at all the sludge still in that deal. But just, I, I remember when I did my first scan, it was actually with the Cirac machine and I saw my prep 30, 40 times larger. And I almost changed my name to Stevie wonder. I thought, uh, you know, I mean, he could have made a better prep and I mean, just seeing it, <laughs> That large, you saw, oh, my God. And then you start changing burrs with in-flat, you know, uh, all kinds of different burrs, just trying to make it look pretty at 30X. Uh, so um, magnification, would you agree that the fundamental technology here is that it's magnification and this sapient dentist can see what he's doing better? I think that's really, really important, Howard. But the other aspect of that, is that it allows you to change on the fly. So in other words, you saw that prep, you do that prep and go, I thought that was good, but I can go back and get it right. And I do that on a regular basis, go back and get it better right then, right there. And then it creates a beautiful restoration that doesn't have to be remade. is isn't going to break. It seats beautifully. I mean, it's the whole process, you know, for a dentist, there's nothing worse than then um, doing a prep and sending it to the lab. And then you go and you go to seat it and the patient goes, you know, it doesn't work and you grind on it. I've had patients come and say, oh, you know, that other dentist didn't know what they were doing because they had to grind down my crown before they could cement it. And of course, that's never happened to me. However, it would, it's, that's the difference is that if you do it right, the restorations really do drop into place. Now it's a journey. You know, it's just like anything else. You have skills you have to achieve. It's not rocket science, though. Gosh, if you can do a mandibular block, if you can get a halfway decent chamfer, you can you you can learn how to have predictability with an intraoral scanner. So, um, my gosh, um, brands are everything. I mean, there's a lot of big brands. I um, I mean, Three Shape has a scanner. Um, Invisalign, Align Technology has the Itero. Um, do you have one, um, I mean, Heartland, I'm sure, is looking at you saying, come on, Bob, which one's the best? Do you have a preferred brand? Do you like them all? I know you see them all and work with them all. Well, I, I've had the opportunity to test. And when I say not just try, but we do trials, serious trials with every scanner that's available in the U.S. market. That is widely available, I should say. And so, uh, and, you know, we we test them in a variety of of levels you know is the software good what's, what's the training like is the support good and i can tell you from a scientific perspective uh pretty much every scanner that's available the little wand part works really really well i mean the science is good they're all a little different um my two i actually utilize in the office uh both the trios and the itero um and there are other good scanners out there the one that heartland chose to go with was the Itero, and it was it's neck and neck between the two of those. But the key issue that moved us forward with the Itero, besides the support and the company and the the product, is also Invisalign uh, scanning. And so that was a big part uh, here at Heartland. We're very big into Invisalign and uh, occlusal disease and caring for our patients that way. So that was a big determining factor. And by the way, um, you just said occlusal disease. You know, uh, most people think dentistry is a cavity, gum disease, but the third one's occlusal disease. I have found it very interesting that Align Technology, which owns uh, Invisalign and Itero scanners, they've take they, they've got data on. I mean, hell, you have data on two million scans. They probably have data on a hundred million scans, but they think um, that. They will be able to get a measurement on occlusal disease from these uh, scans, just like we take bite wings and we can see a cavity. That the occlusal scan, that these uh, occlusal scans and and CBCTs will diagnose occlusal disease um, sooner rather than later. Um, are you hearing that? Do you believe that? You know, we've been working on uh, one of the things I'm passionate about is the what I call the digital platform. So, you know, you have a scanner over here, a CBCT over here, you know, images, 
and the here and there. And what's happening now, and particularly with the ExoCAD purchase that Align uh, did last last year in the midst of the pandemic, uh, we're working and partnering with them to to begin to create this connectivity between all of the different pieces. And so the answer is yes. You know, from an earlier perspective, what we can do today is with the Itero scanner, you just use the occlusal clearance tool. And we call it the the um, the uh, yeah. I just went blank. But it, it looks <laughs> occlusal gram. It's just a heat map of where the occlusion is, and you can see where those functional, non-functional cusps are. Uh, you know, uh, contacting the thing we don't have yet is the ability to see where the condyles are. So, from a true dental perspective, you know that's not there yet. But I don't think we're that far from that. But from the perspective of the patient who comes in and says, you know, my chip, my teeth are chipping on the edges, and this and that. I can show them on the scanner and not just the uh, iTero scanner, but others as well, where the teeth are fitting and give them some idea of, of where they ought to fit and, and why they're having some of the problems that they're having. So, yeah, we, we're, we're all into, you know, when we talk about moving teeth, we're all about um, not just, you know, do they look straight, but do they fit together correctly? And um, was it RIP to 3M's uh, TrueDef scanner? Uh, it's over. <laughs> that and, was... and, and why do you um, why do you think it is? I mean, to me, it, it was uh, it was the powder. Um, wh wh why do you think it's over for the uh, RIP to the 3M's True Def scanner? It, same thing. It was the powder. Uh, no matter how you slice it or dice it, I, I did at one point. I held the record for the most in, uh, clinical scans. It, it didn't last long, but in the early testing. And I just never could get over that powder, you know. That's why the CEREC, that they moved on. Everybody moved on from powder. And uh, it's just a technique sensitivity. So that's why. Just basically, you know, not, that was the key. It's a wonderfully accurate scanner. When you put powder on the teeth, um, it scanned very quickly, but you you had to put powder on the teeth. So um, why did 3Shape not get your business? Was it mostly because it didn't have the clear aligner um, uh, ability with uh, Invisalign or was there something else, uh, anything else to it? In, in my first, in my world, it was about the Invisalign. So we, there was, you know, they had their corporate um, whatever communications. And so they uh, Invisalign, excuse me, Align eliminated the ability to um, submit Invisalign scans through the uh, trio scanner. So, that was a game changer for us in that we needed that capability, you know, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I maintain multiple platforms of scanners in my office along with testing. And you really, it's hard to maintain expertise in more than one platform. So we found it best that, that even though the trios is a great restorative scanner, uh, we found it best to maintain just a single platform in our, in, in our offices. So, um, the Itero scanner, you, you talked about uh, that. That's your main scanner. And your um, your main software with Heartland is Dentrix, right? Dentrix? That, that, is, that it is, Dentrix correct, as, yes. is it Dentrix or Dentrix Ascend? It is Dentrix. We have not gone to the cloud yet. You haven't gone to the cloud. So um, does when you buy an integral scanner, does your um, practice manager software, like in your shape, Dentrix, um, um, you said when you um, evaluate these um, scanners, or you look at software support, occlusal disease, uh, clear liners, um, was the functionality with Dentrix a, a plus or was that a, a big factor? You know, that was one of the things we had conversations. It didn't exist when we first started it. And uh, because we are Heartland, we went to everybody and said, wouldn't it be nice and uh, we helped everybody collaborate to get that done. So uh, we were very excited about that. You know, the ability to launch a scan from the Dentrix software um, and, and to be able to keep track of everything, having it right back to Dentrix. We would like to do more with that. And I, I think that will probably be waiting until the, uh, we get to the Ascend because we can see that the, the days of Dentrix are gradually going to go away. Uh, and so, you know, we, we anticipate to build our future with a, a cloud-based software. So what, what do you mean your days with Dentrix are, are limited? 
Oh, well, the, the, when I say the days with Dentrix, I, let me say that a different way. The days of the, the uh, workstation in the office are where your software and everything resides are numbered. Dentrix is it's great software. We're committed to it. But at some point in time, we'll we'll move to the Ascend or a competitive product. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, you go to something as crazy as your little subway, and you're seeing this subway manager having to install no. a firewall and a computer and all this stuff, and it just leaves them blind open to hackers and all that kind of stuff. And um, everybody that works at a McDonald's or a Subway or a chain of a thousand anything should all have dummy terminals to the cloud. The, the, the question is, well, you're in Oklahoma. That's not necessarily Beverly Hills or Manhattan. Um, is, is internet speed good enough for the cloud in your opinion? I mean, do you think you could have cloud-based system right now in Oklahoma? Uh, we're, we're, yeah, you're in a broken arrow. Yeah, we have fiber. We have fiber right to our office. And most of the metro areas have, have fiber to the commercial areas. That's available. So I think so. I think I don't think we'll see a problem with that. I think really it's it's a matter of of maturing the software and the platform uh, so that it's ready to go to scale. And so that is and, you know, part of it is like in a single office, making a change is can be expensive and painful. But uh, when you have an enterprise that has well over a thousand offices, those changes become come a little bit more slowly. I do know that you know we we are testing different things. Uh, I actually don't know the current state of that, but we are testing different things. But it's going to take time for us to make that. You know, we we have to plan really carefully because if we if we don't do the right thing, it's it's going to be costly. But the good news, if you're watching what we're doing, it'll probably be a very good choice, if not the right choice, uh, to make when we finally choose that. You know. Um... Lots of things come out. Every dentist knows that in the back room, by the time you retire, your back room has a little museum section. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you, I, you know, we've all got, I mean, shoot, God, I mean, it's just crazy. And by the way, if you want to buy crazy stuff like that, go to Dental Town's uh, free classified ads. There's always about 5,000 ads. And there's all kinds of dentists selling stuff they bought for 50,000. And um, it's now it's been a, a piece of furniture. But, um, you know, like when when um, x-rays came out, when when Delta Dental, when when insurance came out for the Longshoremen's Club after World War Two, about 1948 in Washington, Oregon, they covered x-rays at 100 percent. And that was when the domino of every dental office buying an x-ray machine. I mean, Rentkin had been dead for a long time and dentists weren't looking at it. But when insurance covered it 100%, everybody bought an x-ray machine. Um, digital x-rays came out. And um, there's no change in insurance incentive, but man, it took off. Everybody got it. Practice management software. We were talking about Dentrix, EagleSoft, Open Dental. But chair side milling with a CAD cam. I mean, I, I'm not seeing any data points that this really got more than 12% of the market um, for the last 30 years. So chair side milling um, is in, in, in your thousand dental offices that you're working with, is chair side milling taking off? I mean, like, like the original CERAC, like where you scan and mill, or is it now really just going to go from scanning and then sending it to the lab? You know, they, I work with a lot of doctors and I do support all of our platforms. So every version of scanner that we have and every uh, chair side milling system that we have, I don't have an exact number number for you right now, but somewhere between 35 and 45 of our offices out of 1100 and plus are actively milling. What I know and what from being, being a chair side miller for many years, that the doctors who are passionate about it do an amazing job and they continue to be passionate and I support them in that. And we upgrade their equipment and make sure they have what they need. And most of the doctors that I talk to, they, they say, they say, I don't want to be a lab tech. And you know, with the technology today, when I did, uh, when I was an E4D, uh, some programs, you know, I would compare the price of uh, the cost of doing the E4D restoration, it would be the same with the CEREC, to the $160 PFM crown, which was the, the price point at that point at that time. Well, today, what we're talking about is crowns. You can get them, you know, 70, 80, 90, you know, lots of restorations under $100 that are probably pretty well done. You know, many of the restorations are milled on $420,000 milling units. 
and these milling centers, and they they are good restorations. And so, um, so it's harder to justify the economics of it. I'm not against it. I did thousands of those. I had ser- several CEREC set, uh, systems, E4D, but you have to be passionate about it. It is, it is a valuable service. I just don't see dentists going, yeah, I want to do that. I want to learn how to do all those things and teach my team. So our doctors are much prefer to be able to scan and have the lab get back, you know, in five to seven days, a really well-fitting uh, milled restoration. So why do you, so um, why do you think chair-side milling? I mean, to me, it never made sense. I mean, um, here I am for 32 years in the same dental office and um, I fell in love with Impergum early. She was my first lover. And you just take a quadrant Impergum, you send it to a lab, the guy down the street, he's as old as me. He's made like 30,000 crowns. And then your idea is, hey, I got an idea. Let's replace that with a $140,000 CAD CAM machine. And then we're going to teach her assistant who's never made one. And we're going to send her to a bunch of expensive courses in Scottsdale. And she's going to be your new crown maker. I'm like, is there anything right with that argument? I mean, is it all just, I mean, I mean, what, that, that argument just makes no sense. I mean, lab people should be doing labs. Dentists should be doing dentistry. I, I don't understand it. And I bet the 35 of your dentists that do use it, they're, they just love lab work. There was always that guy in every dental school class that would never leave the lab. They just love lab work. Um, is, is, how is Shine's E4D doing? You know, I haven't had a lot of uh, contact with them lately. I, I think they're they're holding their own, but you know the the Serona, the Densply Serona team has really done. If you like chair side milling, I have to say that the Prime Scan uh, is is really a, a really great scanner. We have also tested that for not for chair side milling, but for intraoral scanning. They're still a little bit oriented towards the chair side milling software wise, but it is a ergonomically, it's a little bit challenging uh, because of the weight of the of that that processor in the back end. But it scans really quickly and very accurately. So, um, you know, I think E4D with Plan Mecca, they kind of got swooped into this bigger company that wasn't as um, focused on chair side milling as E4D. That's all they did. Uh, uh, they're kind of just there in the market. I don't see them being a big player currently. But then, you know, again, I, what you said is so important is that chair side milling is not going to take over. It's going to be a part of the market. The beauty of dentistry is that we can practice in a lot of different ways, some of which make sense and some of which don't. But, you know, dentistry is profitable enough that if we if we have a passion for it, we can do it that way. So I support doctors, you know, in our company. You'd be surprised the different styles of practices that we have, the different passions of doctors that we have. And um, and they can be successful if if they're if you're passionate. So I think that's it. Like you said, there's people that love doing that, love controlling the process, being able to mill certain types of restorations, inlays, onlays, funky shapes. Those do still work really well with um, with chair side milling. But if you're going to do just everyday crowns, everyday is not the right word, but just, you know, more typical crown preps and singles and doubles. I think I think sending it to the lab is, particularly with a scanner, is is still the most economically. It's absolutely the most economic, economically productive way to do it. And what are you paying for an iTero intraoral scanner? And um, how do you calculate the return on investment for it versus, um, say, if the dentist just used Impergum? Well, we we did a lot of tests. We we obviously work with significant discounts, and so we don't pay retail. Um, but even with our uh, ability to purchase uh, impression materials at a significant discount, as well as um, the scanner itself at a significant discount, we calculated uh, in, in our initial process of actually taking our real numbers. And, you know, the difference between being in practice and with with the situation I'm in, I have people that that's all they do. They just they have analysts and they say, OK, well, we might spend 30, 40 million dollars on this. Let's put the analyst on it. So we figured about $18 a unit savings uh, scanning instead of taking an impression. And that's two, at least two parts. It's not time or anything, but it's the materials to take the impression and then the shipping because shipping is a cost. 
And so, uh, and then you save three days time because it arrives, the scan arrives in the lab inside of four minutes and they can be processing it. We're working with a, a group, My Lab Connect, uh, a new software that we're get, I get feedback on my scan inside of four minutes to t- they tell me, yeah, it looks good. Uh, even using artificial, artificial intelligence to do the first, the first pass on that. Uh, so it's really about, uh, that's about $18 a, a case is what we figured out in our early studies. So the $18 is from uh, savings um, uh, from um, uh, materials and impression and, materials. And shipping. Hard costs. Um, and plus three days. Plus three days, uh, unless unless your unless your case gets bumped off of a truck because people bought too much flour on Amazon and they had to get the essential supplies to to them because we you probably experienced it. We had challenges with our labs. Uh, you know, dentistry was not considered essential during the the shutdown times. Uh, flour and you know sugar was more essential, so some of our cases were delayed because of that, and so. Um, and the other thing, you know, Howard, the, really one of the things that we that we experienced during the COVID crisis that's still ongoing, but it's more stable now, and that is that the uh, geographic diversity is what I call it. So we had cases. We do a lot of our doctors do a lot of our cases here in the states, but we have we have some offshore labs that doctors choose if if they choose to, and we had cases that were in China, and they couldn't, they closed. So we just, our labs brought them back here, fabricated here in the States. Well, guess what happened a few weeks later? The U.S. labs were closed and the Chinese labs were open. And so the cases went the other way and they went ahead and fabricated them wherever the, the lab was open. And so you have that, you can send it anywhere and it goes in, in a matter of, of minutes. They just click a button, it goes off to where it needs to go. What was the lab software that you were working with? You just said it's my lab connect. My oh, my lab connect. Yeah, and, it's 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 not on the market yet. And and who um, is that? A Heartland company or is that a a new company or? It's a new company. It's Lexier Group. L e i x i r. L e i x x i r. I r. And talk and, talk about that. Well, you know, one of the things that we, we've also seen is there's still a lack of connectivity between the various pieces, uh, lab management software, building software, um, in the office, the scanner and scanner and analog impressions. You know, a lot of labs are, are creating their own apps, their own portals. But the, the NADL, last number I saw was that the average American dentist is using 3.7 labs. So, you know, using all these different apps or writing all this paper. So my lab connect is just a connector. It talks to Dentrix. It talks to all the practice manage, excuse me, the lab management softwares, and it talks to the iTero scanner. And so we've built APIs, Align built APIs for us with them. And so it's, it's an instant communication, two-way communication. While I was sitting here, I was getting uh, notifications on my phone that a scan that was sent was good to be designed. And then I can I can text and and two way communicate, um, and so we're we're anticipating a, a major rollout of that uh, in the in, in the coming year or so. And why um, some some people think ah oh, you're just obsessed with this all digital thing and uh, they're they're not convinced that they almost think it's like an obsession as opposed to a return on investment. But um, do you, I mean I mean even some really older famous dentists um, that you know still have charts, still use emperor gum, they haven't gotten um, pressure materials, they still use the dark room, all that stuff. Uh, um, why do you think, um, do, you, do you think digital is a business decision going forward? I mean, do you think it truly adds up? Uh, dentists have been burned a lot of times by buying $50,000 YAG lasers and, and I mean, um, uh, some periodontists, uh, they treat peri-implantitis with a scalpel. Other people buy a $140,000 Millennium Laser, uh, Lanap, and all that stuff. Uh, do you really think it's a return on investment? Well, I have the data, and it is a return on investment. We have had multiplied return on investment 
the only time there are two key things that we have learned. Actually, data driven. Uh, it's not just an opinion. One is because uh, we track, you know, Howard, we track what our scanners are doing. We have the ability through a dashboard that Align has built for us. We can track every single scanner in every office, not big brother wise, just, just to know we, we need data. What are they scanning? What's being scanned for? What type of thing? Restorations, Invisalign, eye records, you know, just a, a, a model. And then um, there's only two things that keep you from having a return on investment for a scanner in a major way. One is not using it. And the second one, I think this is really important and it's a soft skill. What we know, because I have data, I have offices that do lots and lots of scans and have, and we're talking about case acceptance now. If you're talking to a patient about their problems and you're using the scanner in the hygiene room and your treatment planning, and you're looking at that heat map and uh, of their occlusion, if you just show that to them and go, isn't that pretty? You know, it's like, look at that. And they go, yeah, okay. But if, so what we know is that if you, show the patient to scan, and you connect that with verbal skills, with communication. Because you know, what do we do all day, every day? We help people do what they ought to do instead of what they want to do. And, and so you have to communicate, but the, the scanner is a powerful tool for that. And even when they say no, we, we have the tool called time-lapse, you know, where you take a scan this year, you take a scan next year, and you can show them what's changed down to the micron. And they go, oh, I really am wearing my teeth. So those are the, those are the kinds of things. That's the only time you're not going to have a return on investment. Those two things. And um, the Lexer group, they're really getting big in the laboratory. I mean, uh, Warren Rogers, um, president, um, CEO of uh, Lexer North America and Knight Dental Group. T talk, talk about... Um, do you work with them a lot or do they have a competitive advantage for you or talk about well, Lexer? Le Lexer group has changed a little bit. It's evolved. So now there's two parts to the Lexer group. One is the labs. They have Blue Box, Yankee, Continental, and Knight, I think. There might be missing one. Uh, Lexer group, my lab connect is now a separate company. So it's a subsidiary and it's completely separate. Um, but it's, so a sub we it's a subsidiary, but it's still... Uh, owned in full by Lexer, just a separate yes. manage. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because in order to, in order to work with all the different labs, they had to complete, they built a firewall between the two companies. Uh, so, so there's they now the lab group, you know, our, our, our primary diamond, we call them diamond trusted labs. Those are the labs that we have extensive contracts with. Um, the primary ones are uh, D DSG, uh, dental services group, NDX, national dentex, uh, DDS, which is an uh, American company that they do, the, they're more of a single location in China. Uh, and then the Lexier group, and they have a variety and each of them has a variety of resources. So I can, I can do work in different parts of the United States, uh, Vietnam, China, India, Costa Rica. So we have that network, but we work with those main groups uh, for our, our everyday restorative. And, um, you know, what, um, what is the turnaround time? I've noticed some of these labs are trying to get, um, some, some national labs like, like Glidewell is a class example where, um, you know, they can mail pretty much, you know, all over that two or three days time out, but now they're setting up little pilot programs where for scanning people, you scan, they mail the crown get them back that day. Um, do you think these, um, closer mobile, uh, lab scaling things are going to be a big hit or not really? You know, I, I think the, uh, the challenge there is probably going to be the, the pricing. I do know that one of our lab partners is working towards our, our standard contract with our labs is, is five days turnaround time for everyday restorations. What that is, is Emax and Zirconia. Uh, PFMs are a little bit longer because they're still analog and, of course, removable and implants. And implants is a challenge because the manufacturer part of parts sometimes back order. So we've had challenges there, particularly during the COVID times. Um, there are they're actually looking at uh, up to a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time in the lab. That would still be several days in the office, you know, in the office. 
Um, I don't see at scale, I don't see the pods working as much for same day type of things. I think one of the areas, we'll see a certain amount of that, but there'll still be a back end for the more complex uh, resources because you you need these uh, the technology. You need the, the printers, the carbon 3D printers, you need the, the bigger milling units, and those are scale, those are expensive. And so you need to have the volume for those. That doesn't mean you can't do use technology. You know, our goal is to have the lab tech available in the office virtually. That's what we're working towards with my lab connect and some of our groups so that at some point, you know, you, you would just click the button, you'd start the chat. It'd be like our zoom call, you know, you might have to schedule it, but there'd be the, the tech and there'd be the scans and there'd be the CBCT and on ExoCAD or other software, you'd design the case or review the case, even show it to the patient. We're not there yet in the real time. We're there in, in asynchronous, you know, it takes time. But that's our goal in, in real time is to provide that kind of service. I mean, we, we just went through the gosh darn pandemic. I mean, uh, the coronavirus um, did um, um, what looking at a thousand locations and going through a pandemic, would you say um, oral scanning had any plus or minus or uh, what, what were the takeaways on the pandemic? And do you guys feel like you're out of it? I mean, are you is Heartland now doing per store uh, busyness? Uh, to levels before the pandemic, or are you still suffering in a contraction? We are. We have been very successful. Uh, you know, all through the pandemic, I was in private practice for many years, and I was I was so glad that I was I was part of something bigger than myself. We were actually, I think, very pleasantly surprised that at Heartland, you know, at all levels, that how quickly we were able to come back was as we had all the resources. You know, we had we had a team of people literally working around the clock uh, to get the PPE. We were drop shipping. Some of our lab partners were shipping for us. So our offices were able to open up at full speed. A great marketing team. And it sounds like a commercial, but we have done very, very well. We had a very profitable year last year. Uh, it was, you know, considering the pandemic, it was amazing. It, it was moving forward. It was a lot of growth. Uh, increase improvements in revenue, improvements in profitability, and most importantly, a lot of happy doctors that that were and a lot of team members that were very well cared for, and didn't have to be afraid for their jobs. And I think that was the most important part to me. I think it um, really changed the whole brand of DSOs. I mean, when you're king of the mountain, you don't need anybody. Um, but when you fall from grace and all of a sudden your entire planet is uh, under attack from a virus, um, people realize there's strength in numbers. And I mean, I remember talking to Rick several times on the phone where he's just like, my God, the phone is ringing off the hook of people saying I'm done. Um, were you when um, during this pandemic, who were the most likely to say their strength in number? Is it old guys like us where we're just old and tired? Was it was it a bunch of. Older guys, or was it even new startups in their 30s that are only two, three, four years old? Who was calling your phone the most? You know, um, Howard, I, I don't, we're so big now, I don't have direct contact on that. But I can say that, you know, as as our profession has become more diverse, uh, you know, we, we've, we're seeing a lot of mid-career women join Heartland. You know, they, they had the opportunity, you know, when we went to school, you know, it was not very diverse. You know, dental school was just a bunch of guys. And uh, now as we've made it more diverse and people get into it, um, it's a lot more complicated. And, you know, dentistry was a little bit easier when you, all you needed was a pegboard and a dip tank. And so with all this technology, you need scale. And so we're, I'm just seeing all sorts of people. I, when I first joined, I was seeing people that were much more clo closer to retirement. We still see that. But now we see people anywhere from five you know, at least five years out from retirement to 30 years out from retirement. Uh, those are the people that are really, you know, they, they get to, they have success. They're getting to a certain point. And then it's like, whoa, this is actually more complicated than I thought it would be. And uh, you know what? It's a lot more work than I thought it would be. And I want to have, I want to have some family time. I love the time I was talking to a doctor on a Sunday night who was considering affiliating. And he was at his office doing payroll on a Sunday night. And I said, 
You know, if you join, you'll never have to do that again. You won't be. If you're at your office on Sunday night, it's because you want to watch a football game there. I don't know what you'd be doing there, but. Well, you didn't want to watch a football game last Sunday night. My God, you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You got to know more than uh, you were closer to that nightmare uh, Chiefs game. God, what the hell happened to the Chiefs on the (laughs) Super Bowl? I I mean, you didn't score a touchdown. I mean, my God. God, I mean, I, I'm so glad I don't bet money. I love the NFL. That, that That's my stupid, That that's the biggest waste of time I've ever had is the NFL. I just, I waste more hours on that stuff. And uh, my God, I would have, <laughs> I would have bet, I would have bet a million dollars that if you said, I'll bet you a million dollars, he won't score a touchdown. I'll say, well, I'll take, I'll take your money. You Let's make that, that bet right now. Um, so, um, you're, you talk a lot about developing a digital patient by putting scans, photos, radiographs together within design software to create a seamless workflow between dentists and dental labs. Um, okay, so you're talking about the iTero scans. Um, what about photos? Is there some digital camera or um, what are you using to take the, the uh, photo with? You know, we're, we have a variety currently. Uh, a lo- our when we're teaching our aesthetic programs, Dr. Berlin and Dr. Golden uh, leading that, they're still big, big fans, and I don't disagree with them. The, the SLR you know, camera is the standard still. Uh, we're seeing a lot of success with the, we're starting to utilize iPad type uh, cameras because team members can utilize those. You know, What's the name of that a, camera? Well, the, the the just regular iPad type cameras, uh, tablets. Uh, it works really well with the apps now because so much is is um, app based. You know, uh, Coachman's DSD, which is based off of ExoCAD, uh, other programs like that. They all have their apps, so everything is right there. And so, uh, I think that's the direction that that we're going. For oral, you know, if you're going to do an article or something, you need the macro, but I think we're have, we're seeing a lot of success with that because it has to be simple. If it's complicated, a lot of people won't won't do it. Now, when you talk about radiographs, do of your thousand uh, locations, is it usually the same digital radiograph? Well, I mean, well each you mean, as far as the brand or yeah, or yeah, this far as the brand. You know, we uh, we have we will work with a, a partnership with different companies. And currently, we're working with Envista and uh, Cavo uh, moving forward. We have a lot of care stream um, technology in our offices. Uh, what I'm working with, uh, that's another part that kind of leaks into my area. I'm working with our vendors to make sure that there's compatibility across platforms. You know, the rest of the world is like that. But it's time for dentistry to get out of the well, your stuff can't connect to my stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm, everything is closed off. And so one of the things that I'm working personally on is to open these things up. We can bring the the teams into the room and say, you guys need to work with you guys because this should connect. So I'm, uh, we've been doing some testing recently on several different uh, intraoral sensors to see if they work on the same platform. In other words, if we have a single whatever imaging platform you're using, will that, will it work with multiple sensors? And I'm excited to say that the industry is getting on that bandwagon and they are, you know, with the the Twain compliance standards that you can now begin to plug multiple scanners into a single platform. So what is Invista? Invista is a, uh, a holding company. They own Cavo and Ormco and, uh, uh, my gosh, uh, Kerr, Noble BioCare, um, but anyway, what what is their radiograph? Um, what is their digital radiograph machine? It's the it's the cave. It's Dexas. Cavo. Oh, okay, Dexas. Invista. Then, uh, that's under Cavo. Yeah, and then uh, their their panoramic 3D is based on uh, Instrumentarium. They bought that a number of years ago, and that was the origin of that. It's no longer Instrumentarium. Uh, and you know we're we're seeing a lot of consolidation in, in brands as well. Some you know you've seen that some of the brands that we used to see are kind of being merged into uh, the bigger the bigger picture. And the digital software um, that you prefer the most or that you use the most is that um which one's that? Well, right right now we're working with uh, we're working with Dexa. 
offices, but we're still we're still kind of open to looking at new things. We're, we're evaluating several different options. I don't know what the final, the next solution is going to be. I think next is not a final. It's next solution. You know, we don't change platforms often, but uh, it will it will happen periodically, and we'll but the technology will make that easier in the future. Uh, right now, we're installing Dexis in our newer offices. And you were talking about earlier that um, you want all these machines to talk to each other. So that's an open format, correct? As opposed to a closed it, format? It's opening up. Yes. Yeah, so Dexis currently can take scanners. They can receive information from multiple sensors. And, of course, multiple inputs. Any, any CBCT or any panoramic system uh, can go in there, as well as the photographs. So that's that's a different strategy than your um, software. I mean, the only open practice management software is Open Dental, which is having the m biggest, fastest growth. Dentrix and EagleSoft are more of a closed system. So why Dentrix closed system, but p prefer everybody opened up and go to open system without? I mean, is switching to Open Dental a thought? I, we we have. I am not aware of that. So I'll I'll be honest. I'm not that directly connected to what our future is looking like for the practice management system. Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, but in the digital area, what we're really looking at is making sure that the digital platform with Im patient images and patient um, scans is open or at least connected. They're connected to each other seamlessly from the user's perspective. You know, um, on these ESOs, I, I have to tell you, um, I'm, I'm, I've always been for them because I'm for competition for the patients. I mean, America's got 320 million people. In the first 30 years I lived here, you fell off the bike and broke off your front tooth on a Sunday, you know, you'd find a mermaid before you found a Dennis Open. And now, because of DSOs, where Arizona is ground zero for DSOs, because Governor Ducey passed a law that if you're a licensed professional in any other state, uh, you're licensed practice in Arizona. And they did that because these hospitals over here were trying to recruit registered nurses from Ireland. And they said it was easier to get a nurse to move from Ireland to Arizona than it was to retake the boards and move one state over. And Ducey said enough. So now, uh, Arizona, 18% of the dentists work for a DSO. I mean, it is ground zero. Everyone's here. Um, um, and, and the other thing you said earlier about, um, you know, um, there was a change in demographics. So when we've gone from a mostly all male profession to now um, half and half, and I have lots of friends right here in my backyard where it's a single mom, she's raising a child that's, you know, and I, I know one that's been raising it from age birth to 10 or 15 um, working at um, um, Pacific. And she loves the fact that she can be a dentist, a mother, and the other thing is um, owning your own practice. I mean, it's, it's kind of like bowling or country music or, or rock and roll. I mean, you, you have your preference. Some people just love it. They You see them on, when they're on vacation, um, they're reading business books. And other people on business on vacations, the last thing in the world they want to read is a business book. So I, I just, you know, you either love business and want to run one, or you don't love business and don't want to run one, but it really has nothing to do with being a dentist. No, and, and I, I don't think, again, the complexities of the world we live in today just make it that much harder. The insurance, you know, you, the, the games that the insurance companies play, and, you know, we're, I'm very fortunate. I, we've got some very smart people, and they're actually cracking the insurance nut. And it's, it's amazing what, what the games that they play, thanks to the monopoly that they've had for many years, for decades, um, but there's just so much more, you know, uh, updating computers. You know, I, I don't, I remember, you know, we've been computerized for a long time. I got my first uh, uh, practice management system in 1992. It was, it was crazy. And it was a good old DOS. But, um, you know, now I don't spend weekends shopping for the best buy on a workstation or worrying about my data security. Um, it, people do that for me. And, you know, when you have 28 workstations, it's just, it's much more complex. And so I think that's, for me personally, aside from all the other things, it's just having a, I call it a we, you know, it used to be, I have to, whatever. Okay, I'll take care of that. I'll whatever. Now it's like, 
uh, oh, I'm going to take great care of my patients. We need to, and that, that's where the sentence ends, you know, air conditioner is broken. We need to find someone who can fix that for us. Well, guess what? I have a we, and that's what I like so much. It's just having a we, you know, and I can do dentistry. I thought it would be harder to, to do a little bit more dentistry to help share the wealth, to have pay somebody to do the management stuff and all those things. It's actually easier. Uh, it, it, I, you know, I have so much more energy for the clinical part than I did before I, before I affiliated. Um, you're working with uh, a lot of, uh, young dentists and they come out of school and when they come out of school, it, it, it concerns me because they, um, they, they want to do it all. I mean, they, they want to learn everything. They want to learn, you know, there, there's 12 specialties. You can't, God, you can't be an oral surgeon. I mean, placing implants, just learning bone grafting would blow your mind. Endo, perio, pediatrics, ortho, pros, dental anesthesia, oral facial pain, oral med, oral path, oral radiology. How do you take this bright-eyed and bushy-tailed little baby who <laughs> wants to learn everything and try to sit there and say, okay, but come here, I, I need you to stick your nose in this because these are the types of procedures and patient situations that, you know, can that you need, you need to focus on and pay the bills and all this stuff. Where, where are you trying to steer them? Well, you know, we, we know from our data that uh, and us, but, you know, root canals, simple extractions, uh, you know, a little bit of denture stuff. That's what we do as general dentists. If we want to have success, and we just, it's a lot of coaching. You know, we have a, a, a one, the first year track for doctors that's, pretty well laid out leadership, a little bit of, um, you know, basically a lot of leadership, how to lead a team, because that's so important. Uh, and then, you know, clinical skills and learning how to stretch yourself. And then do we have mentorship? So we, you know, if a doctor says, Hey, you know, I want to place implants. It's like, great. I'm so excited. You want to do that doctor. The first step is let's go learn how to take out some teeth. And so, so it's a matter of really mentorship and getting, you know, senior, and when I say senior doctors, it might be somebody, you know, it's the see one, do one, teach one. So a lot of third year doctors who are passionate, they're mentoring new graduates and helping them walk through that journey. And then of course, many of our offices have two doctors. So there's usually a partnership between the doctors along with another outside doctor who's a mentor, who's just a friend. So I think it's just a matter of managing expectations showing them the next step. Where do you want to be? You know, I want to build the Golden Gate Bridge. Where do we start? How do we start building a Golden Gate Bridge? Well, first we start with this. And then most doctors are, are really, really uh, ready to embark on that journey if you lay it out for them. You know, I, I mean, I, what we said is so profound. I mean, the dentistry, it seems like all the dentists I know that um have an office, they do a million a year and they take home 275 to 375. I mean, just crushing it. They're never in Beverly Hills in Manhattan. There are nobody, nothing towns out in the middle of nowhere. And um, the bread and butter practice, you know, they're doing seven to 10 root canals a month and they can pull teeth. I mean, you, you got to be the, in, in fact, the answer to that in my mind, when I ask myself that, what specialty would you want to be, that you all have to start with the dental public health specialty because you each have a location. I mean, imagine going to the hospital. Uh, imagine you fall down off your bike and you break your arm and you go all the way to the hospital and they say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't do arms. Uh, we just do legs. <laughs> I mean, you'd like, what the hell? I thought you were a doctor. And you, uh, patients going to come in because they're in pain. And it's 8.5% of emergency room visits. And if you can't pull the tooth or do a root canal, they're never going to go to you again. I mean, you're not... Um, when they needed you, you were a no-show and you weren't a real doctor. And they even say that. They're like, well, I'm a cosmetic doctor. Okay, well, I don't know what a cosmetic doctor is, but I don't think a person who does boob jobs and tummy tucks is the person I'm looking for. If I break out in pain, I'm, you know, bleeding or whatever. I mean, real doctors get you out of pain. They deal with blood. They extract teeth. They do um, uh, They do that. And I think going to um, off on implants, oh, my God, uh, I'd, I'd want you to uh, master pulling toothaches uh, before you went on, on that. And a root canal, a lot of dentists just sit there and say, well, you know, I don't like endo. And I always tell them, well, 
Um, humans are 200,000 years old minimum, and about 110 billion of us have lived. And I'm sure a lot of those 110 billion people had to do a hell of a lot of things they didn't enjoy, like being stuck <laughs> in a cave all winter during an ice age. Do you realize humans have lived through two ice ages? How would you like to spend the whole winter in a cave eating mastodon poop. I mean, so you just, I, I, you have to learn extractions and root canals. And then the basic crown and bridge fillings and hygiene, all that stuff just rounds it out. And if I had to list all the million dollar practices that I know where they're making a great money, they don't do, uh, they don't place implants. They don't do CAD cam. They don't, they don't do any of this fancy stuff. They don't even have a laser. They're just available, open, and, um, you know, they're just, being normal. I mean, do you do you see any technology stand out that is a practice builder? I mean, you got a thousand offices you're looking at. If you said, here's a technology that will make you stand out and build a bigger, faster practice, what would you say? Well, I, I think today, I think it's patent, what we call patience facing technology. We're, we're really starting to roll that out. Patient, we just rolled what? out patient facing technology. So and we're not at the we're not at the forefront of there. There's a lot of doctors that are doing that, and we're not fully out that. You know, the, the ability to fill out your medical history. The medical offices are doing it. Fill out your history on your phone. Um, you know, we just this this week we converted uh, all of our in, our hygiene appointments. Any opening that we have is available online, and so you know, and it's two ways. So, you know, I just had a, a recare patient come in. Uh, Two weeks ago, she said, "Yeah, I'm so glad I, you you know I I just booked it on my phone, and I'm so excited that I was able to do that." So surprisingly, what I think I'm really passionate about now is those kinds of things that connect the patient to us digitally, um, and that would be the the ability to do paperwork, the ability to um, a, a book appointments, uh, moving back and forth. We're working here at my office. It's not a Heartland thing yet. Um, working with the teledentistry, like with dental monitoring and AI, monitoring and um, clear aligner therapy remotely, utilizing camera tech, iPhone camera technology. Uh, so those are the kinds of things, the things that the patients see outside of the office, I think, are the really next great opportunity. So that so um, patient facing technology. Um, what would you say are the leaders in the, that platform in the dental space? You know, there it's still it's evolving so much. So I, I, um, my from a from a AI remote monitoring type of thing, where if you want to track people uh, remotely, dental monitoring, dental dash monitoring dot com is a fairly new technology. It's truly AI. Um, there are a variety of vendors when we're talking about online uh, booking and those kinds of things. I'm not familiar specifically with um, the different vendors there, but I think that's key. Anybody who can help you, um, you know, enter your data, enter your patient information uh, without using paper. I think those are key factors there. And of course, um, the, uh, the ability to communicate is is the number one thing. I I really feel, you know, I've done a few telemedicine visits utilizing Zoom and those kinds of things. And I'm I'm a more of a fan of a dedicated um I look we were looking at a couple different vendors for that, a truly dedicated platform uh where everything is more seamless. I haven't identified my favorite yet. I'm so old school that you know I, I think <clears throat> One of the biggest problems that young kids have is number one, they they can't. Um, it, it's hard for them to diagnose and treatment plan. I mean, they were they want to go learn a skill set. They want to place an implant, do an Invisalign case. They want to do something like that, but just diagnosing and treatment plan. And um, probably their local periodontist is the best one at. I mean, I've thought about this for years. It just seems like all the periodontists, if there's one thing they do better than gums. In perio, it's actually the, the, the treatment plan. Mm -hmm. So if you ever want to learn that, just call your local periodontist 
because he's trying to send you cookies and cakes to uh, get you to refer and just say, will you help me diagnose and treat and take some cases over there. And, um, and then the other thing is talking to the patient. And it, it's so tough because the roadblocks they set up to become a dentist, you basically got to sit in a library, be an introvert geek weirdo, and all the well-rounded people who, who were dating and, and, and frats and, and drinking too much, all that, they, they didn't make it into dental school or medical school. So the so this this bizarre collection at the end of the funnel is a bunch of introvert mathematician physicists, and they don't talk to people well, and they'll even tell you, well, I don't want to sell dentistry. Well, dude, if you don't sell dentistry, they're not going to get their four cavities fixed, which will turn in from four $250 cavities to four root canal buildups and crowns. So get rid of the sell thing. A doctor comes Latin word, no ceremony to teach. They just they just don't like um, to present treatment, and then when you and then in Dental Town we pulled them because on Dental Town on your if you start a thread on the first poll you can uh, on the first thread you can make the post a poll. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, most dentists blah blah blah, and I say, well, can I see the data on that? And they don't have any data. They just they just think it. I'm um, kind of like when everybody agrees that humans have are made of one trillion cells, and then their gut microbiome is ten trillion cells. So all the microbiologists said, wow, that's cool. Where'd that come from? They found out it came from nothing. It came from one guy. <laughs> and the New York Times put a microphone in his face, said, where do you get that data? He says, oh, I was just saying, you know, I was just making a point. I just used two numbers. There's no data there. Um, but how do you, does, um, how do you get, uh, or this digital dental patient, this digital patient and all this technology, um, intral scans, digital radiographs, how can you this help the dentist explain treatment because you're selling the invisible when you go to sell me a bottled water or an iPhone I know what it is but when you look at me and you say um, dude you have four cavities Robert and you need to get these fixed how can this help because if if I don't believe you or trust you or, or know what you're talking about I'm not going to get treatment and so then I'm a worse dentist I mean, you can say all these things about how great you are that you got your FAGD, MAGD, all that stuff. But, you know, if I, I got I got four kids, forget them, six grandkids they are more important than your kids. If I have six grandkids and I send them to you and all six of them had a cavity and you got them to get out their credit card and get it fixed. And then the guy next to you um, only got three out of six to get it done. I would say you were the best dentist. And that other guy next door is a loser. And he may came back to me and say, but I'm board certified. I'm my fellowship and diplomat. I mean, you have to sell dentistry. And my homies don't like it. So how do you coach young dentists um, to present treatment with successful outcomes so that you can actually be a good dentist? Well, you know, that's our early, our first year, uh, first year education track. That's the main thing. It's a it's about communication. Every every team member goes through communications, which is kind of its roots were in you know you would remember you would remember Walter no Walter Haley oh, you know yeah. that he was he was one of our muses back in the day at Heartland you know and and it's a takeoff on that and it's about the patient relationship. It's not about us. It's like take yourself out of that and you know we have a we have a, a process of of kind of organizing the steps of communication. But the two key things, and even coming to Heartland, I still didn't really have those, was um, a dominant buying motive. Why am I here today? An emotional treasure. What is my belief system? And unless you connect with that in a meaningful way, you know, my emotional treasure. You know, my mom had dentures, and I hated it when she put them on the counter. Or a lot of the guys, like, I just, Doc, I just, I just saw one today. I just want to chew a steak, Doc. You know, it's like, okay, great. Then everything we're going to talk about is chewing steak. And you better take care of what they came to you today for. I mean, I, I don't care what kind of program you came from. If you don't take care of what their dominant buying motive is today, then you, you just what you said. And so we really focus on that. And you, you just have to learn how to connect with people emotionally. It's an emotional thing. You know, half of the nerves... One of those things, just like the trillion bi trillion bacteria, I just remember see, hearing this somewhere that half of the nerves that leave our brain go to our face. Now that includes our optic and our ophthalmic and everything. But when you think about it, 
you know, this is just a very sensitive place. You have to connect with people emotionally. And that's the bottom line. There's not a, it's not a secret sauce. It's just about being real with people and sitting back and listening and hearing what they have to say and then giving them choices and helping them choose the best one and not being afraid, which is one of my challenges. I want everybody to like me, not being afraid to tell people they don't, they, they, to tell people things they don't want to hear, but also being empathetic while you're doing it. Man, I can't believe you said Walter Haley. I mean, yeah. he was a <laughs> legend. Um, he was he lived 1927 to 2003. I'm looking up at this. It's like I can't believe he died 18 years ago. Are we just older mm-hmm. than hell or what? Uh, of course not. We're just we have really good memories. And we were all <laughs> in junior high school when Walter was busy. Wow. So, I mean, yes. that is a um that was just a, a, a amazing uh, flashback. Uh, what, what did uh, um, we've gone over an hour? We're over time. Um, what do you, what are your uh, takeaways of Walter Haley? Um, well, I don't I, think, I don't I think th- he's been mentioned on the, on the show. Well, you know, the, the, I think the the real thing, the, the the way it's amalgamated in from then into now is is really about ju- just the the teamwork, the communication. The believing in something. I think it's really about believing. It's about caring and believing. You have to have a guiding force and you have to pursue that. And I know that's kind of vague, but you know, to me that that's, that's really, you know, I've been to a lot of different programs. I've heard you speak. You're the best speaker I've ever heard. Aww. And uh, the, the key is, is that it, we come to, it, it focuses around to the process of, of connecting to that person, building a team, building a team around a common cause, and then uh, helping that person that you're serving kind of circling back to understand what their problems are, but help them find a way to move forward. And it's it's not rocket science, but it can be complicated at times because people are prickly, but we just have to be real with people. We have to meet them where they are. So... And and that was a um, he did a lot of good for a lot of people, just getting them to uh, to realize that there's a human uh, on the other side of that mouth, and uh, a lot of people just don't get it, and they need to get it. But uh, long live Walter Haley. He was uh, gosh, yep. um, he was born. Uh, he passed away on July twenty second, two thousand and three. I, I remember the first time I went there. I think I went there with uh, David Hornbrook, and uh, and. Um, mm-hmm. And, but anyway, uh, interesting guy. Well, um, my gosh, good luck with those kids. I, I feel that all <laughs> knowledge, the only value in knowledge is if it's transferable. I mean, um, you know, you're supposed to leave the playground better than you thought. So, you know, one day everyone who's in the present right now alive will be gone and we'll have our replacements and how we deliver our knowledge to our replacements so that they got a better chance is, is everything. And, uh, and you're handling the most precious commodity in dentistry, the young babies. My final question I got to ask you, they're, they're very different than older people, but they don't like to be told that. So if you're a millennial right now, you might want to stick your fingers in yours. But like my mom's brother lives up the street from me and uh, he got a job at mobile oil when he was 16 in the mail room and retired there when he was 65. I mean, that's just what they did. And luckily, he checked that 3% box to uh, for the retirement, so he's doing well. But when you go to the greatest companies that for millennials, I mean, Facebook, Google, Uber, Amazon, all the high-tech firms, the average millennial at, at Amazon um, only lasts there a year. Facebook keeps them the longest at two years. Um, when you're uh, uh, any company... Hiring a bunch of baby millennials, they'll they'll look at you like, oh yeah, I'd like to do a year here, and then they you know they change your mind and go do a year somewhere else. So how do you keep? How do you reduce the employee turnover when uh, you're competing against a dental office? If he's an owner operator, he opened that up at 25. He's going to sit in that building till he's 65. How do you grasp and handle uh, employee turnover, which which they do not just in DSOs but in private practice? I mean, they do it everywhere, but it seems like whenever I meet a dentist five years out of school, they've already had five different jobs. So how do you, how do you work with that? Any advice on that? Or is it just is what it is? You know, I, I think really for, for the younger doctor, 
looking at different opportunities. You have to look at it with a business sense. And because, you know, one of the, the compensation models are all very different. And um, what we do is we work to help that doctor have success, I think, you know, and how they define it. The very first thing we do is we sit down with doctors, you know, part of our initial get to meet you, here's Heartland, you know, we call it Heart Start. A, a big part of that is understanding who we are, but then also spending time understanding what what am I the dentist looking for? What am I the the new graduate or the new doctor looking for? And then managing to those expectations as much as we can, as long as they involve showing up for work and taking great care of your patients. And so I think, you know, what we do is we try to help the doctors grow and we try to help, uh, you know, help them grow in the manner that we know from our data that if they have financial success, along with their clinical success, they're going to be happy and they stay. And so we're really building for the long term uh, for that. And then secondly, you know, when doctors want to make changes, the good news, uh, you know, with a situation like Heartland is that we can accommodate that. We have, we can cover a maternity leave. We can help a doctor relocate to another state pretty seamlessly. And you can't do that in private practice. So in a way we can cater to those kinds of desires and needs it's like well you can work for heartland and three and i have i know guys and girls that have lived in three different states and work for heartland a friend of mine is down in florida now in jacksonville and he started here in tulsa he went moved to colorado and now he's in jacksonville because of personal good personal reasons and he's been successful excuse me he's in he's in uh uh he's in jacksonville i wanted to say that right yeah, and it's also more challenging because, you know, after, you know, during after World War II, people got married at 16, 17, 18 right out of the gate, and now they push that back a decade. A lot of them come out of school and um they meet someone at a continued education class and it's the love of their life and one's in Virginia and one's in Pennsylvania and they they're, they're going to move. And and you can't blame them. So uh on that note, just good luck to everything you're doing. What you're doing is so important and it was just an honor to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Howard. Thanks for the uh, invitation. All right. Have a rocking hot day, buddy. Okay. Thanks.